At Balchem Animal Nutrition and Health, we strive every day to deliver results you can see in your animal's productivity and your bottom line. From a smooth transition into the milking string for your fresh cows, to a happy welcome home from your furry friend. From a strong start in your poultry flock, to consistent weight gains for your finishing hogs. We expect to earn your business and your trust with our people, our products, and our science. Our people have an intense passion for your animals and your success. You can count on us for honest, candid advice and practical solutions for your toughest challenges. As the global leader in choline production, chelation, and encapsulation technology, we take our obligation to you and to the environment seriously. Our products are backed by the most extensive and thorough research portfolio, while our business is committed to advancing environmental sustainability and animal welfare. In the end, it all comes down to results. Balchem delivers real results you can count on, results that exceed your expectations, and results that bring true value to your bottom line. Leading the charge to meet the nutritional needs of ruminants, monogastrics, and companion animals, Balchem offers a growing portfolio of nutritional products and a dedication to innovation and industry sustainability. Balchem is here to solve today and shape tomorrow. As the global leader in choline, Balchem has spent more than 50 years perfecting the art and science of choline chloride production. The new Puricol line delivers the highest standards of quality, produced in state-of-the-art manufacturing facilities, and backed by the strictest process controls for a level of purity, safety, and consistency you can't find anywhere else. Turn to Puricol choline chloride from Balchem for an unmatched level of quality you can trust. Visit balchemanh.com to learn more. Hello everyone and welcome to the Real Science Lecture Series. My name is Scott Sorrell, Director of Global Marketing for Balchem, and today we're talking all things swine genetics. We're excited to take a look at a different side of the swine industry and one that's been advancing rapidly. I'd now like to introduce uh, Dr. Tom Rasche. Uh, Dr. Rasche serves as Chief Technology Officer at DNA Genetics. Tom currently works with key accounts and is responsible for genetic and product research, including ongoing strategy for the genetic program, genomic technologies, trait development, and the applied research program for DNA Genetics and Pellet Family Farms. Tom received his PhD and MBA from the University of Nebraska. Go Huskers. Tom, the floor is now yours. Thank you, Scott. Let me get started sharing the screen here. So I want to start out and just uh, really thank Balchem for the opportunity to visit with the audience today. Uh, hopefully have kind of a new twist on this seminar series to look at uh, the advances in, in genetics and, and what the implications are for feeding the pig. Um, I'd, like, I'd like, though, to start out by making a, a, a really important statement is that I'm a geneticist, not a nutritionist. And so my goal today is, is not to talk so much about nutrient requirements and things of that nature, but really uh, kind of a threefold goal to uh, share with you how the pig is changing over time. Uh, I want to focus on the traits that are changing in the biology of the pig and, and kind of provide for you an expectation uh, of the future and, and where we've come from in the past as well. I, one of the things that I thoroughly enjoy about what we do is, is really understanding the biology of the pig, uh, how we're able to change that from a genetic standpoint um, and, and I want to share some of that background with you and really take a deeper dive into our, uh, I'll use our program as an example, but I think it applies across the industry. I uh, also want to demonstrate to you the speed of this change because genetics is moving faster than it's ever moved before. So our reaction to that has to increase. 
And throughout the presentation, I'll be throwing in some examples to hopefully stimulate some, some thought and, and ideas. So a lot of people like to jump right to the bottom line. So I'm going to do that in this opening slide here, but we're going to build the background in as we go along. Um, what I'm going to leave you with today is the rate of genetic change has increased dramatically uh, over the last decade, but I think especially in the last five years. And that's largely due to genomic selection. And we're seeing response rates in our populations that are anywhere from 25 to 50 percent higher than they were five years ago. So the, the speed of change has, has increased dramatically. Uh, really what that means for us as an industry is that when we look at managing our livestock, feeding our livestock, uh, all of these things that we're used to doing in the past have to be looked at and, and our rate of change has to match that of, of genetic change because really for us to optimize the opportunity uh, we have to respond faster. So there's implications across the industry. Uh, we're going to talk about both sows and grow finish today. And, and really, you know, the nutrition of the sow is probably the hardest thing to research and maybe is the area that's most lacking for us as an industry. Uh, but I think is really important for us to, to really pay attention to, especially with the faster rate of progress we're seeing. And then finally, grow finish recommendations. I'm going to say we need to look at updating those about every three years, and I'm going to hopefully justify that statement as we go through. So let's start out with the sow. Um, so I'm going to use our, our program as an example and walk you through uh, how we've looked at uh, uh, our maternal genetic program, and, and, um, and, and hopefully that'll stimulate some, some ideas for you. So the, the DNA program really, um, about a decade ago, we sat down and took a very hard look at where the sow of the future uh, needed to go. And we landed on uh, this, I guess you call it a tagline or a slogan for our program, but it's really become a driving force for us. And our goal with the, the um the F1 sow is to have our average sow have the genetic ability to produce 14, 14 pound pigs at 21 days of age. And so that's really become a driving force for us. And, and to accomplish that uh, as a team, then we looked at, okay, what do we need to do if we're gonna hit this goal over time? And so the biological model for this, um, you know, when you think about what a sow needs to do for an operation is obviously she needs to have adequate litter size to produce and wean 14 pigs. Those pigs have to be high quality animals uh, that are going to survive and thrive and go on to wean. And then that sow has to provide a maternal environment that uh, really helps those pigs get to that 14 pound mark in that 21 day time period. So we're gonna break this down as we go through and start with litter size, uh, and then we'll move on to pig quality and a bit on the maternal environment as well. So let's talk about litter size first. Um, the trait that we use in the index for litter size is live pigs at, at the fifth day of life. So as opposed to using total born at birth or number born alive at birth, we, we've chosen to use uh, a measure of litter size after the first five days. Uh, this actually began in our program all the way back in 2004. Uh, the unique things about this trade is it obviously does continue to increase litter size if you put selection pressure on it, uh, but it also has the benefit of eliminating sows from your selection program that have high total borns with very poor survival. So I think we, those of us that work in the pig industry know of those animals that might have 18, 19 pigs born alive, but the pre-weaning mortality might be as high as 50%. Uh, those types of animals are, are deselected with an LP5 approach, and I think that's one benefit of that trait. Uh, it reduces the stillborn rate, but probably the most important thing is it's almost uh, uh, I, uh, has a correlation with number weaned of pretty close to one. So where this came from, uh, this was actually developed, and, and this paper is in the Journal of Animal Science, if you want to go look it up. Uh, there was an original project that was done by Sue et al. 
uh, using about 7,500 landrace sows and 5,500 Yorkshire sows uh, to really look at how do we uh, find a new trait to improve litter size and pig quality at the same time. And, and this had followed a decade <clears throat> of selection for pretty much total born. Uh, and there was a tremendous response over that prior decade, prior to 2004. So about a three pig improvement in total born, but as you would expect, uh, when you push total born without considering anything else, you're gonna increase pre weaning mortality. Uh, you potentially decrease birth weight or you will decrease birth weight over time and you're gonna get this decreasing response in number of weans. So something really needs to be done differently um, after or during selection for, for litter size. So a few key things that come out of this work. Uh, first of all, the question is when do pigs die pre-weaning? And I would encourage anyone that hasn't done this to look at this in most any operation. And what you'll see uh, is that if you look at this chart, this is the, the day of life uh, post farrowing, and this is the mortality, the percentage of mortalities that occur on each specific day. So in this first 48 hour period, you'll see the vast majority of mortalities take place. And then out here by day five, it practically drops off to zero. So Really, when you, when you just think about this from a practical standpoint, if you can get a pig to the fifth day of life, uh, it's not on autopilot, but it's, it's gonna go on to wean. So all the action is really in those first five days. <clears throat> the implication for management in this, a chart like this is if you're uh, thinking about where you focus your team on a sow farm, it's really in these first 48 hours that are the critical time for saving pigs. It's not out here, obviously. And so there's application uh, uh, there as well. So this really fits that pattern of why you might choose the fifth day. Uh, if we look at then a little deeper at these different traits, uh, this chart shows two breeds, Landrace and Yorkshire. Uh, the trait is across the top. And then on the diagonal is the heritability of each of these traits. And then the off diagonal is the genetic correlations between them. So the first thing a geneticist would look at is, is this trait heritable? And as you can see, this 0.09 heritability in Landrace, 0.07 in York, and these, these are from the, uh, the 2007 paper. Uh, there is a heritability that's really very similar to total born and born alive in both breeds. So we have a similar heritability, that's encouraging. Uh, but what was really key in this is if you look at the correlation between LP5 and number weaned, it's 0.99 for both. So if you're trying to define a trait that's gonna be an excellent predictor of number wean, uh, LP5 is far superior to using uh, even born alive, which is certainly better than um, total born, but you can see that total born is all the way down at 0.3 in Landrace and 0.53 in the York. So you can begin to see why there's a disconnect between uh, selection on total born uh, to increase litter size over time. Uh, perhaps more importantly, though, if we look at the genetic correlations between these traits and survival, uh, if we go down this LP5 column, uh, you'll see that there's strong positive, generally strong positive genetic correlations between survival at birth, which is your stillborn, right? Uh, survival to five days, as you might expect by the trait definition, but then survival all the way to weaning um, uh, in the land race. Uh, the Yorkshire is pretty close to zero on that one, but nevertheless, strong positive correlations. When you look here at total born, these are all negative. So what this tells you is, in, you know, just blindly selecting on litter size is going to decrease your survival rate over time. So those are some of the background reasons why we would choose uh, to use live pigs at day five, with positive effect on survival rate. Uh, it gets rid of some of the negative effects of selecting for total born. So that was implemented uh, all the way back in 2004. So as we looked at 1414 then and started to look at this next step on pig quality, uh, we had to ask ourselves, what can we do to really, <coughs> excuse, excuse me, put more emphasis on pig quality itself? And so the first trait we would gravitate to there is obviously birth weight. And uh, we learned some really interesting things about birth weight. We began collecting birth weights on every pig born in our system uh, all the way back in uh, before 2014. And we learned that birth weight is a trait of the sow. 
it's not a trait of the pig. So in other words, if you want to produce bigger pigs over time, you have to select sows that have the genetic ability to produce a bigger pig. Uh, you're not going to select a high birth weight gilt, for example, and, and see that she will go on to produce bigger pigs. The biology does not appear to work that way. It's a uterine effect and a uterine capacity issue uh, that impacts birth weight. So to, to make uh, genetic progress, we're going to have to identify and select those sows that produce heavier pigs at birth. And we did initiate that in our populations in July of 2017. And I mentioned LP5 here as well, because as we were developing the birth weight trait, we did learn also that LP5 is having an indirect effect on birth weight. So those sows that, um, let's say you have two sows that have um, 15 pigs born alive at birth, the sow that generally wins the LP5 race is the one that has the heavier pigs. And you'll see that here in a moment in the genetic correlations. <coughs> So why birth weight? Well, I think the obvious reason is in these two charts right here, um, both for our Yorkshire and land race population. Uh, these are survivability charts. And so if I add some lines here, I think this is a little bit easier to see. Uh, so this red line here represents the average birth weight when uh, we were collecting these data uh, about six or seven years ago. So you can see on average, they're about 1.2 to 1.3 kilograms. And if you go above the average, so these are pigs that are pushing three pounds, um, you can see the survivability of those pigs is extremely high. Uh, it's it's uh, between 95 and 100% of those pigs survive. The pigs that give us issues are these down here that are below average. And this, this just falls like a waterfall. And if you move over, uh, one standard or two standard deviations off of the mean, these pigs that are down here around 800 grams have about a 50-50 chance of survival. So the concept here is if we can move birth weight on average higher, uh, we can get rid of more pigs that are down in this uh, danger area and improve the overall survivability. And indeed, what you would predict from this chart is if we can move the average by uh, 100 grams or a tenth of a kilogram, uh, we'll see about a 5% improvement in pre weaning mortality. As an aside, I wanted to throw this slide in today, too, because uh, one of the things we also looked at in, in developing this trade was to, um, uh, there was a lot of talk in the industry and actually still is today about the variability in pig size when you get into larger litters. And what you're looking at here is the average birth weight um, of, of the pigs across various born lives. So it goes all the way up to 25, but this is kind of the typical uh, peak of the distribution right here, this 12 to 16 range. But what you'll see is the standard deviation of birth weight of pigs within these litters really isn't changing much at all across this entire range for either the Yorkshire or the land race breed. And surprisingly, all three breeds are very similar in that 0.3 standard deviation. So at least in these populations, going to larger litters does not result in more variability, but I believe because you have more pigs, just with a normal distribution, you'll likely have more small pigs to deal with. So I think we have to be careful how we define these things in the industry. Um, but nevertheless, a very similar distribution across those, those different litter sizes. So litter size, has, or excuse me, uh, birth weight has some other uh, nice, uh, 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 I guess, features to it. Uh, First of all, when we look at the relationship between LP5 and birth weight, it's really interesting to look at total born. Uh, so these are simple regression coefficients of uh, birth weight on total born. And you'll see here this negative 0.28 and negative 0.027 actually translates into uh, the reality that if you select on total born, every additional live or total born pig will reduce the average birth weight by 27 to 28 grams. 
If you look at the LP5 relationship, that falls to one third of, of what we see here for total borne. So again, emphasizing that LP5 is putting indirect selection pressure on, on pig birth weight, and that falls down to seven and 10 grams. So that's, a, um, again, a nice relationship to understand and, and, and when, you're, when you're building out a selection program. Some other nice characteristics, uh, these are regressions of our on-test weight. So this is a, a pig that's 11 weeks old, and our off-test weight is a pig that's 23 weeks old. <clears throat> and you'll see that um, these regression estimates are very high. So there's almost an 8 to 1 relationship between birth weight and on-test weight. So a, a pound of birth weight is a lot, but that's probably the easiest one to think of. Um, you know, if you have a pig that's two and a half versus three and a half pounds, that three and a half pound pig here is going to be uh, eight pounds heavier at 11 weeks, 15 pounds heavier at, at 23 weeks of age. Uh, it's, it's going to um, be a hundred and it's going to grow 110 grams faster per day and uh, in nursery and then 80 grams faster in finishing. And that's consistent across all three breeds, slightly different coefficients, but uh, nevertheless, if we can produce bigger pigs through selection on the sow, it's going to have a positive impact on finisher performance. So we implemented selection, as I mentioned, in 2017 for birth weight. And I think it's fascinating to look at what has, uh, has happened in the populations. Uh, I'm showing you here the 219 trend, and I'm going to show you 2020 on the next slide. But very consistently across these years, we've seen about a 30 gram improvement in our genetic trend for maternal birth weight. So again, this is the sow's effect on the average weight of her pigs, meaning that um, what you would expect from this breeding value is that her pigs on average are gonna be 30 grams heavier, um, if you will, than the generation or year before. So 2019, 2020, again, saw a very similar trend uh, with that plus 30 grams. But what's really interesting, I think, in terms of biology is, is this chart. So this black line on top is live pigs at day five. And you can see in 2019, we went from 0.04 to 0.43. So nearly a four tenths uh, increase in live pigs at day five. But notice the total born trend is about a tenth of a pig. So if I had left a chart in here prior to selection for birth weight, these two lines run more or less parallel to each other. So there is a slightly higher trend for LP5 than total born, but without birth weight, those lines really run almost parallel. So by adding birth weight, we've created separation between pigs weaned and total born, which is exactly what we were hoping would, would happen in this kind of a selection scheme where uh, the DNA sow uh, really is known to have probably the best total born in the industry. Uh, we don't need more pigs. And I think generally in the industry today, we, we probably, don't, um, probably don't need more pigs born. We need to wean more of the pigs we already have. Uh, so if we're giving birth to 17 or 18 live born pigs, but we're still only weaning uh, 13 of those, obviously there's there's a gap there. And until we can wean more of those pigs, there's really no sense in improving total born. And so it looks like um, uh, what we're seeing here is that we're changing the biology of the, the female so that uh, she's producing a bigger pig that's going on to wean uh, without increasing litter size at the same rate that we were previous. And that's continued here in 2020. Again, we see that uh, almost three, well, between three and four tenths improvement in LP5. And then in 2020, we had a very flat trend for total born. So uh, really changed that relationship. Uh, it's very, it's a fascinating biological change for, for me to think about, um, but seems to be working very well. So the proof gets to be in the pudding a little bit and, and it's fine. I showed you genetic trends earlier, but you know, you, you certainly want to see the actual change in, in phenotype over time. So uh, really to kind of back up this whole story, uh, these are our two maternal lines, Yorkshire in blue and Landrace in black. This is when we started selection for increased birth weight. 
and you can see that we were averaging around 2.8 on the Landrays, 2.7 on the Yorkshire. Didn't see a lot of change in 2019, and you would expect that with a maternal trait because here you begin selecting your first replacement gilts. Here, going into 2019, is when their daughters become selected. So now you've got a maternal trait that's backed up by a couple generations, and you can see we've, we've, we've really moved uh, almost lockstep with what the genetic change predicted from a, a 2.8 pound pig to nearly a three pound pig at birth. And then the Yorkshire from a 2.7 to a 2.9 pound pig at birth. So uh, seeing strong phenotypic trends. And then if we look at the average of the breeds uh, for LP5, uh, moving from 2016 to 2021, 1.5 more pigs. Uh, at five days over a six year period. But this is the survival curve. So remember earlier when I said that if we can move um, birth weight by about 100 grams, we would see an improvement of about 5% in pre weaning mortality. And that's indeed almost following exactly what, what those predictions were at the time. So we're nearly up 5% in uh, pre weaning survival. And we're also up, um, you know, over a three-year period since we started selection, uh, about 100 grams. So it's really following very close. So uh, very excited about those trends. But again, the biology of the animal is, is changing because of this. So the last section on the maternal side is talk a little bit about the maternal environment and the impact uh, that we're trying to have there. Uh, I'm not going to talk about teat count. Uh, we're we're working to increase teat count in the lines. I, I think that that would be fairly, fairly typical. Uh, but we had to look at a trait that we could use for milking ability. And, and uh, to do that, in 2015, we began to collect a number of additional uh, weights on pigs. Um, we had the birth weight already, but then we recorded weights on pigs when they were fostered and where they came from and where they went to. Uh, if a pig died, we recorded the weight and date of death. And we also implemented a protocol in our nucleus to uh, load all of our uh, sows, as many as we could, and, and gilts to functional T count plus one more pig. So we were really trying to push the, the lactating ability of these, of these animals. And all of that, any fostering that took place was in the first 24 hours, and then the litters were not moved after that. Um, and if we, we always prioritize the gilts because that was their first litter and we wanted this phenotype uh, on them. So with this data set, we could calculate pre-winning growth rate for nearly anything you can think of. We could look at the total weight of pigs weaned. Uh, we could look at the total weight a sow added to the pig she was allowed to nurse. Um, there were uh, probably seven or eight different definitions that we looked at uh, as we were developing this. But where we landed is a trait that's actually very similar to birth weight. So today, uh, what we do is we measure birth weight and weaning weight, and then we fit a genetic model that actually is more or less a maternal model uh, that allows us to select for the sow's impact on pre-weaning growth. And so just like birth weight, what we learned is that um, the pig's genetic ability for pre-weaning growth has a heritability that's pretty close to zero. And it's really the sow's uh, contribution that controls how those pigs perform. And so you can select on that. It has a strong heritability. Uh, and, and you can identify those sows that no matter whose pigs they're raising are going to raise a heavier litter. And so uh, that's what we uh, implemented. In, and that was implemented in late 2018. Uh, and if we look at our genetic trends uh, from 2019 to 20, we're up about four grams per day in pre-weaning growth on that trait. Uh, five grams in the last year from 20 to or from 20 to 21. So a total change of of about nine grams, which doesn't sound like a lot, but if you multiply that out over 21 days. Uh, of a lactation period, that's nearly four tenths a uh, pound of weaning weight that can be added with, with that approach. So 
I think it's a unique approach to get at um, the sow or the maternal contribution to pre-weaning growth, which is obviously going to give us a heavier pig. Uh, biologically, probably don't know exactly what all the components are when we select for those sows. So for example, uh, you could be selecting for sows that have superior colostrum. You could be selecting sows that have uh, more milking ability or more milk output. Uh, there might be a change in behavior on sows. Perhaps those sows uh, simply are better mothers and they lay and expose their udder more often and take care of the litter better. No matter what it is, it has a heritability that's moderate. We can make genetic change and we're producing a result that, that we're we're, uh, we're after it with more weaning weight. And again, looking at phenotypic trends, uh, um, seen uh, here when selection began, again, you have that lag with this maternal trait. So not a lot of change from 19 to 20, but here in 21 had a 13.4 average weaning weight. So you can really start to see that change starting to, to take hold. So let's take this one step further then with um, kind of a field example of, of what genetic change is doing in the industry and how, how we might need to respond to it from both a nutrition and management perspective. And so everything I've showed you thus far has been from our, our nucleus system and those trend lines, but I think you know where the rubber meets the road is what's happening at the commercial level. And I think this is a great example data set um, uh, what you're looking at here, this is a this is 50,000 sows that have been the same genetics all the way back to 2014, same farms, uh, same genetic type. Uh, this number here is called grade transfer. Just think of it as number wean, but it's uh, pigs <clears throat> that arrive at the nursery. And then if there's any rejected pigs, it's basically subtracted from number wean. So it's a true starting point in the in the nursery. Uh, in 2014, this system was at 2675. <clears throat> in 2020, 2965. You can see the grade transfers per sow farrowed has moved from 11.05 to now 12.57. Pre union mortality has moved from nearly 19% down to 15%. And the average weaning weight, I think, is really fascinating because here we have 13.2 pound pigs in 14 and 15. Uh, we were a little lower here through the middle, but then in, in 2020, <clears throat> we're back up at that 13.2 pound level for one and a half more pigs. So <clears throat> if I summarize this, um, this total born trend uh, at the commercial level for this system has been at 0.25 pigs per year. Uh, number born alive at 0.21 pigs per year and pre-weaning mortality has fallen by <coughs> over a half a percent <coughs> per year. But total wean weight, if you look at the number of pigs weaned, has gone up by 36 pounds uh, for each sow on an annual basis. So sows have basically maintained weaning weight while weaning an additional one and a half pigs. So kind of bringing this all home on the female side, what are the uh, implications for, um, uh, for sow nutrition? Well, I think first of all, we're producing more pigs. So uh, we have a female that's uh, weaning one and a half additional pigs over the, the last six to seven uh, year time frame. So we have to think about how do we uh, feed that animal during gestation and maintain an ideal body condition while still uh, feeding her properly to develop the conceptus and the fetus. Uh, so what are those gestation requirements? Uh, also sows that are in lactation, uh, if they're you know, weaning 6.8 kilograms more per litter, um, that gets to be a, a situation where what are the energy and protein requirements and the feed intake requirements for sows during lactation so how do we manage a sow so that as she goes into lactation, she has a strong appetite and she's able to consume the calories and the other nutrients that she needs to properly lactate that litter? Uh, how do we develop that litter in utero? And with the change that's taking place, that pace, I think those requirements are going to change over time. And that's difficult to do, but I think it's... Uh, 
one of the things that you'll see here in a moment when we talk about genomics is that genomics has moved the maternal side much faster. And so we're gonna need to respond quicker than we, we ever have before. So moving on to um, uh, the next segment, I wanna touch on growth and efficiency. Um, so growth and efficiency is really impacted by uh, both our maternal and our terminal objectives. Uh, if you look at our maternal objective, uh, the terminal traits encompass about half of that objective. So the females are, are definitely contributing to grow finish performance. If we look at our Duroc objective where you don't have any female or maternal component to it, it's totally focused on efficient lean growth. A uh, lot of emphasis on gain and feed efficiency. Uh, loin depth is also uh, a part of our selection scheme, but nevertheless, uh, really focused on efficient lean growth. So if we look over time, this is just our, our trait improvement to kind of set the stage for, for what, what uh, we'll talk through here in a second. But the Duroc, if we start there, has the greatest amount of genetic change occurring in feed intake and finishing growth, as well as nurture growth. Uh, we're seeing an approximate feed to gain change of about 0.04 with an additional millimeter of back fat. The maternal lines will not be at that same rate because half their index is focused on maternal traits, but nevertheless still seeing improvement across the board in, in those grow finish traits. So here's where our market pig would be. A uh, couple things I want to point out. Um, we are selecting a pig that has increasingly higher intake. So we're able to achieve uh, improvements in feed efficiency by allowing intake to go up, but having that be extremely efficient intake. So you can see this is a one-to-one -one ratio between additional intake and finishing growth. That's highly, highly efficient additional intake. And um, uh, we believe that that's important never to improve feed efficiency by allowing intake to go down. Uh, we know intake obviously drives growth, but also it is strongly related with survivability as well. Pigs that have a, a strong appetite do have better survivability. And we've been able to uh, prove that to ourselves through some other research we've been involved in. So these pigs will have increasing intake over time, uh, higher growth rates, and obviously increased muscling. So what do these relationships look like? So I've just taken a, uh, some trial data that we're going to go through here in just a moment, and that's my baseline. So in that trial uh, data, those pigs grew 908 grams a day. Uh, they ate 2,420 grams of feed per day and just over the entire finishing period. So Feed efficiency in this, and this would be commercial pigs at a 267. But if we look at our predicted genetic trend of plus 25 grams uh, over a 10 year period, we're going to go up <clears throat> by about 250 grams of intake and then uh, almost 1,100 grams of, um, or excuse me, over 200 grams of, of growth and feed efficiency is moving at between 0.03 and 0.05 on an annual basis. So something to keep in mind here is that this change in daily gain is about two and a half percent of the mean over time, while the change in intake is only about one percent. Um, so <clears throat> eventually there's probably going to be um, a balance point between those two traits we're going to have to consider. But the change in growth I want to emphasize combined with the feed efficiency is has a much bigger impact than than on feed intake. So. Uh, feed intake and, and just because of the, the baseline mean uh, is changing at a relatively um, lower rate. But it's interesting what I believe we're, we are definitely starting to see in the pigs is that we are changing the growth curve. And uh, I'm, I'm going out on a little bit of a limb here, but this is trial, uh, trial, uh, trial done in 2020 and data from that trial on feed intake and then another one in 14. And they didn't match up exactly and probably didn't even have the exact same diets. But generally what we're seeing is that when we get out here into late finishing, we are seeing uh, increased feed intake um, of these pigs because their growth curve is extending further out uh, in their life or in their lifespan. So I, I really believe by selecting for efficient lean growth, we're changing the, the uh, maturation curve of these pigs uh, we want a pig that's lean 
and efficient and grows fast to about 300 pounds. And the way you would think about doing that or the consequence of selecting that way is you're going to pick pigs that perhaps have an, a later maturing um, body size uh, so that you're uh, harvesting those pigs in that more ideal range. So I believe that's happening and it's affecting our intake patterns. So I'm getting down to my last five minutes, so I'm going to uh, go through a few of these slides rather quickly. But I wanted to show you um, a lysine titration trial that uh, was completed uh, just recently, uh, where we were looking at a standard diet here at 100%, and then flex between 80 and 120% to try and dial in um, lysine titrate or the lysine needs for the pigs. And every time you see yellow, uh, is the, the particular lysine level that, um, uh, based on cost of uh, per pound of gain, was, was the one that jumped to the top. But here's what I want to point out as we go through. Uh, if we look here at the feed intake uh, across the board, and when these pigs are young, you're not going to see the pattern. But as we look at, at some of the older pigs, so here's, uh, I should have said, here's the weights, the start weight and the end weight for this a particular finishing period. And you'll see the same on each slide to give you some reference of, of where we're at in terms of pig maturity. So if we look at the intakes across the board, even at these lower lysine levels, very strong intake, but you can see that these pigs had a lower lysine intake. They had the lowest growth rate, poorest feed efficiency. That's what you would expect from a lysine titration. If we go on to the next phase, again, very similar intakes across the board, but you can see we're getting into a range here, even though this had the lowest daily gain, feed efficiency was very similar. Um, and the gram of lysine intake was about 20 grams uh, here, which is very close to what the optimum uh, turned out to be. Now we're starting to get into some heavier pigs that are in that 150, 130 to 190 pound range. Um, you're getting to a point in that pig's life where its ability to eat and the size of its appetite is almost overcoming our trying to reduce its lysine level uh, to slow those pigs down. So we're at a 218 on this group. This group happened to be a 23. Here's the ideal, but really not a significant impact on growth. Of course, you'll see the feed efficiency response. Now we get into pigs that are 193 to 250 pounds. This group here had a 6.8 pound uh, uh, per day intake, which was the highest of all of them. So these pigs are really trying to compensate for uh, and completely making up for their lower lysine <clears throat> level in the diet. And this last one is the finishing period. And, and our nutritionist at the time said these pigs aren't reading the book. So I'm going to really try and uh, drop my lysine so that I can try and get the curve that I'm after and, and drove them all the way down to 0.3 lysine at this last diet. <clears throat> you can see here is the ideal, only 11 grams of intake. And only then could we get this response uh, to lower growth and increase efficiency. So I think further evidence that we are changing this growth curve, um, especially at, at later finishing. Um, I would mention too that, you know, generally as you go through these, at least for today's cost um, and, and the way these diets worked, about that 21 to 22 grams of lysine per kilogram gain uh, seemed to be kind of an optimal point. And again, I'm not a nutritionist. I don't know if our selection program is going to change that uh, relationship over time, <clears throat> but that would be something to, uh, to keep in mind. So, Really to conclude here, um, if we look at uh, a 5% change in feed efficiency and growth every three to four years, uh, generally, I think if we think about 5%, is that enough for us to look at updating our nutrient requirements? And I, I think it probably is. And so as we make genetic change every three to four years, we're seeing about a 5% move in all of the, <clears throat> the traits overall. And so that's probably a good time for us to be asking the question of, of updating those nutrient requirements. So last section today, I just want to um, leave you with uh, the acceleration of genetic change to kind of paint the picture of where 
uh, we're headed and, 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 and I think the industry in general, but really the advent of what's called genomic selection has resulted in dramatic improvements in the speed of, of genetic gain. So what is gen genomic selection? <clears throat> well, really it's an improvement in the accuracy of choosing the right parents. So a breeding program is all about determining who is allowed to reproduce and your decision on who those, which animals those are drives your genetic response. So the better we can make that decision, the more response we're gonna make. And genomic selection is really all about the relationships. So a good example to think of here is that if um, you have uh, yourself and your siblings, uh, you would assume that you've each inherited a random set of uh, genes from your parents and that you on average are about 50% related. And indeed that for years with the quantitative genetic approaches that we had, that's what we would assume in our genetic models. With the advent of genomics, we can now look at the actual DNA level and formulate or calculate a direct estimate of the relationship between animals. So theoretically, full SIPs can range anywhere from 0% related to 100%. Now that's not gonna happen very often, pretty slim to none, but it can happen. But most, most full SIPs fall between 30 and 70% relationships. So if you're looking at separating animals within a litter to choose who's the best boar, who's the best female, uh, genomics allows you to do that sort because you can calculate the true relationship amongst them. Uh, it also allows you to calculate that relationship even across families. So if there's DNA that's shared across families, that again improves your accuracy of, of predicting what that animal's performance is going to be. So again, higher accuracy, better decisions, more genetic gain. So a couple more slides on what that looks like. So this is our genetic change per market pig that our Line 600 has produced back to 2014 as a base. So over this entire time period, that's $10.56 per market pig coming from the traits that you saw in that pie chart uh, earlier. That's $1.51 per year, but right here in 2018 is when we started to um, uh, uh, began using genomic selection. And you can see right through this 2017 to 2018, there's more or less an inflection in that curve. A little hard to see here. But if I put this line in, you can see where if we had stayed on our program without genomics, this is the progress we would have expected. And this gap is what's been achieved by adding genomic selection. So that overall $1.51 in these last two years has moved to $2.32 per market pig per year. And that's about a 50% increase in, in progress because of the addition of, of genomic selection. Another way to look at that, this is the same Duroc population. So <clears throat> back here in 14 through 17, uh, we were moving at about a dollar per market pig, which is pretty typical of where a terminal line would have been uh, prior to genomics. Uh, you can see after adding genomic selection, that jumps up close to $1.80 on average. So again, it's, it's a very significant increase in, in the, the genetic change. This last jump here, uh, at least in our situation, is because our herd size has matured in our Duroc population. We've been able to dramatically increase selection intensity. And in 2020 and in 21, we've been close to this $3 uh, mark on a change per pig on, on the traits in the index. So. It has a great uh, dramatic effect on lowly heritable and sex limited traits. Uh, so LP5, maternal birth weight and feed intake, our sow is changing faster, uh, our terminal line is changing faster, and we have to keep up with that change. So circling back to our conclusions, um, you know, we're 25 to 50% faster than five years ago. Uh, we have to respond as an industry to that change in genetic progress if we're gonna optimize the performance of our pig. Um, the nutrition of the sow is the hardest to research, but probably an area that is most lacking for us as an industry. And then I'm recommending every three years or so updating uh, any grow finish recommendations. So thank you for your time and uh, be happy to move on to the, the question session. 
All right, thank you, Tom. Before we get started answering questions, we'd like to share a brief video, and then we'll be right back to answer the questions submitted during today's presentation. Organic trace minerals come in many types and formulations, leading to confusion about chemistry, terminology, and methodologies. With Balchem's Keysure line of chelated minerals, we provide superior performance and exceptional value by keeping it simple. Binding minerals to the highest quality plant protein-derived amino acids and peptides in our world-class production facilities, using a true chelation process pioneered by Balchem and trusted in both the human and animal arenas for nearly 60 years. The Keysure line delivers proven and consistent bioavailability to maximize performance and a no-frills pricing approach for greater profitability. Visit BalchemANH.com to see how Keysure chelated minerals are your link to superior performance and exceptional value. All right. As a reminder, uh, you can still submit questions through the Q&A tab on the top of your screen. Uh, Dr. Rassi, this is this is all very uh, uh, exciting and uh, very interesting. Um, and you mentioned how quickly uh, changes are being made. And it, it causes me to wonder, um, it's only going to get faster in the future. And so I'm wondering, how quickly are we going to reach uh, biological limits? You know, that's a great question. Um, I've been asked that from time to time uh, throughout my career and and even um, you know the mentors I've had and the people that I've respected in the industry that that have gone before me have been asked that and you know what's fascinating to me is that as soon as we start talking about a biological limit the pig the sow whatever you want to describe proves us wrong genetics has a tremendous amount of capability to uh, continue to improve and change. And I, th I think it's up to us to unlock some of the secrets, if you will, of, of how to make those improvements. So a, a good way to think about that is litter size. Um, you know, you could say if we had continued to select for total born, we were probably nearing an optimum. Uh, we weren't seeing the same change. But if we rethink that biology and really kind of get into uh, how that process works, uh, we can continue to improve change and output. So uh, I don't know where the limit is. I'm, I'm sure they're out there somewhere, but uh, I don't, I'm not worried about them in my career right now. So, <laughs> you know, a lot of your uh, data is based on uh, performance per per parameters. I'm curious if um, as a geneticist, you're taking a look at um, palatability uh, characteristics in the, in the final product, such as color, flavor, tenderness, those kinds of things. Yeah, that's, that's an area that, um, you know, we've been following uh, for quite some time. Uh, it's interesting that meat quality was a, was a hot topic back, um, you know, 20 some years ago. And, you know, I, I, I think as you look at the change in the industry, it's, it's kind of reemerged now as a much more um, uh, viable topic to really look at in terms of genetic programs. And what I mean by that. Uh, is that if you look at the change over the last 20 years in the industry, um, at, when we, if you, if you roll back the clock, we had really moved to um, uh, very high lean, efficient piatrin type terminal sires. Uh, <clears throat> those tended to, 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 to not do as well in meat quality as let's say a Duroc and maybe some other breeds. Uh, we've seen this dramatic shift in the industry as the packers have really kind of woke up to that fact and said, okay, we need to bring back quality. So the Duroc breed became a way to do that, an avenue to do that, and I think will continue to be in the future. But our pig, I think, and our company probably isn't unique, was designed really to be dropped off at the plant. So the market signals to us were we want a lean pig, we want an efficient pig. We're not paid for meat quality. I think that's starting to change, though, because we've seen further consolidation and integration. We're seeing more producer ownership of packers where there's a perhaps a direct economic drive now to have a superior product and brand. So as I look in my crystal ball to the future, yeah, I definitely feel that um, uh, 
uh, the time is probably on our or it's on our doorstep to, to begin to look at those traits from a genetic standpoint. Certainly have to give a lot of credit to our packing industry for a lot of their technology that's that's really enhanced meat quality over time as well. Thank you for that answer, Tom. Uh, Steve is asking, how much variation will you experience in weaning age? Do you need to standardize uh, weight to a corrected 21 days? Yeah, so in our uh, in our selection program, it is standardized to a fixed age. Um, but <clears throat> if the question relates to, um, um, I guess, maybe I can, I'm not sure sure if the question relates to um uh you know the impact of weaning age and growth finish you know, certainly we're seeing more and more people move to an older weaning age uh, because of the extra weaning weight that has achieved the better survivability in the nursery those pigs simply start better those types of things so i think all of that has to be considered uh, but if you're looking at um you know our standardization yeah we we would we would standardize that measurement all right, thank you. Uh, Carr is asking how much improvement is coming from genetics and how much from nutrition in this parameters of pre-weaning survival? Great question. Since I'm given the talk, I can take more credit for that, right? <laughs> but, you know, I, I certainly believe that these, uh, you know, over time we've, we've made tremendous advancements in nutrition on, on feeding the sows. There's certainly, um, it's been difficult to find research that's been consistent on a nutritional approach to increasing something like birth weight. But I think the possibilities are still there and we just need to understand the biology better. Uh, but if, if birth weight has a strong impact on pre-weaning survival, that's one way we're going to do that. And then certainly uh, the sow's ability to lactate is, is another piece. So I, I don't know what the percentage is. Uh, we're all working hard to make it better. and and uh, I, there's contributions from both. All right, very well. Uh, Zach is asking, can you discuss a little more about how you are doing your uh, genomic selections? You have specific SNP chips for your program? Yeah, we would, we would have um, a 60,000 yeah, 60, uh, SNP array that we're using. Um, it includes uh, you know, honestly, both public and proprietary content, but it's optimized for our populations. So it's it's um, very similar, I think, to what a lot of people would be using for our for our program. All right, Clay is asking how variable and heritable are milk components, uh, percent fat, protein, Ig levels, etc. That's the new frontier. That's an area of interest uh, for us, uh, looking specifically at colostrum quality, for example, is there a heritable component to that? Um, is more milk simply, is that the only answer or are there component traits? I, I honestly haven't looked in the literature. I'm not sure uh, what estimates there are out there, but um, when we think about really affecting <clears throat> the postpartum period <clears throat> and uh, pig survival, that, that has to be part of the question. All right. Um, so what role does sound nutrition play in piglet birth weight? And what are the top nutritional considerations when feeding sows for increased birth weight? Ah. So you're, I know, you're, ask, you're a geneticist, I know. Ask so a take, take a swing at it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can tell you what I know from just our field experience. So um, they're at least on a guilt. Uh, if a guild is maintained in proper body condition, meaning that she's uh, ideal body condition or like a three minus type of body condition, I think we're seeing some evidence that um, you can bump feed those gilds at 90 days into gestation and, and you're going to see a bit of a benefit in, in birth weight from that. We don't see that same impact in our sow. Uh, so it might be a guilt development issue that we would see. Uh, I think there's... Um, whether that's energy or protein or both, I'm not a, I'm not sure about that yet, but at, at least what we've seen there. The other component I would say is that uh, feeding the sow immediately post weaning appears to have a pretty big impact on birth weight. So when those sows come out of lactation, getting them back into ideal condition as fast as possible uh, seems to be very important in 
you know, perhaps the quality of the eggs ovulated, the quality of those embryos and so on. And that probably has as much to do with, um, you know, pig quality at birth as uh, maybe even more than a bump feed later. By then it's too late. A real quick commercial for our podcast. We're going to have a follow-up podcast uh, with Dr. Rathchi and a nutritionist. So we ought to, to address both sides of those kind of questions. And so uh, be looking for that to drop in the next couple of weeks. Um, next question comes from uh, Kwong. In your view, how does epigenetics play a role in the genetic selection program? That's a question I honestly probably haven't thought too much about. Um, certainly, um, I, I would say in today's programs, it probably plays very little role, just the honest answer, because we're, we're primarily driving at uh, selection on, uh, you know, additive genetic variants, heritable traits, uh, not considering a, a epigenetic approach, if you will, to, um, to a selection program. So how that would work, um, I don't have a good answer for that. So I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to plead that, uh, that, that needs some more research. So. All right. Very well. Uh, next question. Does nucleus selection on purebreds always translate into improved performance in a commercial barn and how can this be addressed? Um, what holds back genetic potential? So three questions there. Yeah, good. Um, so I, I think in general, if you look over time, uh, obviously genetic change has at the nucleus level in purebreds has translated commercially because we do see genetic trends in the industry. If you look at a system wide basis, you know, for things like growth and feed efficiency and litter size, you see that trend uh, occur. However, I do believe that we can do um, a better job today with the tools that are available to us. So one example of that is a program that we've started, we call our full program test. So in that program, we have a sow herd uh, that's basically composed of our F1 female. It's 100% pedigreed and entirely genotyped. And then those sows are mated to nucleus duroc boars. And those pigs are individually identified. And basically we're collecting the same data there that we would collect at a nucleus level. So that allows us to take a look at, uh, particularly in that case, grow finish performance and, and look at do the sires rank the same uh, in that environment compared to the purebred environment. Um, another component of that is uh, we have about 20,000 commercial sows that are 100% pedigreed uh, so, and those are out in four or five different sow farms, real world performance, again, be able to look at their performance uh, and then use that information directly back in the nucleus. So we could use that crossbred data to select our, our nucleus parents. So those those things are, are in process and growing. Um, yeah, over time, uh, I, I think progress is definitely there, but we can enhance that, particularly with the use of genomics and, and getting some real world data uh, to, to make that more accurate. All right. Thank you. Um, I see, Tom, that we've uh, crossed the top of the hour. That's my signal to start winding things down. We've got time for one more question, though, and uh, we'll end with what are some of the uh, larger challenges faced with the swine herd in the industry today? And how can you address these in the genetic program? So I, I think as we look to the future, some of the, uh, you, you've seen our program with the 14, 14, 21. And as we go, we think about what industry is struggling with today. Uh, one of the things that comes to mind is sow death loss. So if you look at the industry, there's a positive trend for sow death loss over the last decade. Uh, why is that occurring? It's occurring across all lines um, that are available in the industry today. So I think understanding that death loss component and addressing that with a, you know, one component of that is gonna be addressing that genetically. So can we select animals that are more resilient, more robust? I think that's one of the bigger challenges out there today. Uh, certainly disease resilience uh, in general for the grow finish pig, I think is going to be another a key area that we need to focus on going forward. Um, what, what form that takes, there's a variety of different options uh, but generally, we want a more resilient pig and grow finish as well. So I, I think these crossbred 
programs that I just described are going to help us identify sires of pigs that are going to be ro more robust. We've, we've actually um, implemented that in, in our selection program in August and um, really looking for some positive trends to, to begin occurring in, in that area as well. So those are two of the bigger areas. I think the third one I would come up with goes back to a question, your first question on, um, on uh, meat quality, for example. So as we look to a, a genetic program that uh, isn't that is still designed for the producer, but perhaps now is designed more for a pig that is a fully integrated value. I think those types of challenges are in front of us as well. And how do you balance that? Uh, you know, the more traits you work with, the slower the progress in any individual traits. So how are we going to prioritize those? Very good. Well, this has been very interesting and uh, certainly looking forward to digging into this a little bit deeper with the, the upcoming podcast. So thank you, Tom. And thank, thank you. you, everyone, for attending today's webinar. If you have additional questions, please submit them to anh.marketing at balchem.com. The Real Science Lecture Series of webinars continues with one more webinar in February. Next Tuesday, February 15th, Dr. Charles Starkey from Auburn University will discuss the many opportunities to upcycle low value proteins using functional food technologies that promote sustainability while enhancing profitability. And then on March 1st, Dr. Israel Flammenbaum from Cooling Cow Solutions in Israel will help us look at the best ways to manage dairy cows in extremely hot environments. Visit balchem.com slash real science for more details and to register. Balchem's podcast series continues to offer a deeper dive into our webinar topics. Log on to your favorite podcast platform or visit balchem.com slash podcast. Subscribe to the Real Science Exchange and send us a screenshot along with your address and t-shirt size, and we'll send you a very cool Real Science Exchange t-shirt. On behalf of Balchem and Dr. Rathji, thank you for joining us today. <laughs>